Your neighbor, if you don't want yours, I'll take that too. I'll take your miracle, your healing, your promotion, your increase, your anointing, your next level. You, if you don't want it and you're going to sit quiet on it, just give it to me. I'll take that too. Romans 8, 28, if you're ready, say amen. And we know. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to guess on it. It's not a maybe, a perhaps, or a should. But we know that all things, I'm giving you the King James, and I'm going to jump back to this English Standard Version, work together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. In verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. Those who he justified, he glorified. In verse 31, when they, when, what then, rather, shall we say to these things? If God be for us, yeah, that's one of them drop the mic moments. Next time your haters are nipping at your heels, if God be for then who or what can be against me? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us how many things? How much do you have access to? How much did he give his son to, to prove that he would give to you? All things. All things. Jump back to Genesis right quick. Come on, this is the heart of the matter. We're going to really spend some time on this particular text. My dad and my mom, they're out of town today. So if y'all are watching, they usually stream me. My dad will be in somebody else's church streaming me. That's my dad. He's been sitting in other pulpits and... Of course, I knew he was there and knew he was in their pulpit on that day. And so he would call me and say, I enjoyed the word today. I'm like, how did you see me? He said, I was streaming. I said, but you was in somebody else's church sitting in the pulpit. He said, so? I can't wait till I'm retired and can do what I want to do. I'm going to be a retired gangster for the glory of God. Amen. He's like, so? I wanted to see my son preach. So, Daddy, if you're watching... Pray for me. I'm doing the best I can with what y'all gave me. Genesis 37, 18 through 24. You got it? I was trying to give you time. Here we go. They say, they saw rather him from, from afar. Who was they? The brothers. Who do they see? Joseph. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And verse 19, they said one to another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we'll just say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. Verse 21, but when Reuben heard it, somebody say Reuben. Reuben. Okay, pay attention to that name. He rescued him out of their hands saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Don't kill him that he might rescue him out of their hands and try to restore him to his father. And then 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him, threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, for there was no water in it. Somebody say, there was no water in it. Now, I want you to jump down, if you will, to verse 20, no, actually 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it that if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us just sell him to the Ishmaelites and let's not lay a hand on him for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren, they were content with this idea. In verse 28, then there passed the Midianite merchantmen and they drew him up out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 30, 20 pieces of silver, about $30. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Can we pray? Father God, in the name of Jesus, I need your help. Preach through me. Let your anointing now overtake me. Let your glory fill this house. Saturate this place. Every, every person in this place, let them now be engulfed with your glory. Let the glory cloud begin to manifest miracles, wonders, and all the miraculous things that come with being in your proximity. We yield now to your will in this place. Have your magnificent way. Speak through me that the people of God would leave here better than they came. And get the glory, Jesus. 
be glorified by everything seen, said, and done. In short, Lord, help me. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our phenomenal God. Where are my prayer warriors? Just make some noise right quick. Thank you, Jesus. I'm in good shape. I'm wrestling with a sinus infection, so if you pray, I'll preach. Let me try it one more time. I said, if you pray, I'll preach. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So, those of you who were here last week, you will know that we began our discovery of this concept of extraordinary. And you can't experience an extraordinary life, extraordinary blessings, favor, or abundance in any capacity unless you first of all and foremost know that we have an extraordinary God. And if you were here last week, we did a phenomenal job at unpacking and unlocking that reality, that truth for our own circumstances, that we serve an extraordinary God. Tell somebody around you, our God is extraordinary. Turn to the other side and say, my God is extraordinary. And so because we have an extraordinary God, we also now have access to and we've been exposed or given uh, the benefit of an extraordinary grace. Say that to yourself. I have extraordinary grace. Come on, say it one more time like you mean it this time. I have extraordinary grace. Some of you could not put the life and you couldn't put the excitement, the tenor, the tone, the vigor. You couldn't put all of the dynamics that you needed to put into saying that. And it's just because you may not be completely clear or totally abreast of what extraordinary grace is. So just to understand it, you must first of all define the foundation of it, which is grace itself. Grace is defined as free and unmerited favor from God. It is free, undeserved, or unmerited favor from God. And it is manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. Two forms or two ways that you have experienced extraordinary grace or that you have access to tap into the extraordinary grace of God. Number one, through salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. We are saved. Ephesians 2 and 8 says we are saved by faith, by, through grace, by faith, by grace rather, through our faith. And so that is the first ex exhibition of grace in that we are sinners and, and we are saved by the grace of God. Let me make sure that I clarify that the scripture does not say you all have sinned. It says all have sinned. Are you with me? So tell your neighbor he's talking about you too. No, 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 you got to say it like you got a little bit more too than that. He's talking about you too. You don't sit here all, all holy and sanctified. The only reason you are here saved right now, the only reason you don't act like you used to act, cuss like you used to cuss. Come on, some, some of y'all don't do the things that you used to do as much. We better be real up in here with each other. It ain't that you cut it out, it's just that you don't do it as much. And the only reason you are here to say that is because of the grace of God. It was God's amazing grace that arrested you, that captured you, that took control of your heart, that took authority over your mind and causes you to respond with the mind of Christ. Scripture says, let this mind be in me, which is also in Christ Jesus. That's the portion. That's the source of my grace. Please know that I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm doing in this side if it hadn't been for the grace of God. He saved me from myself. Come on and think about it. If it hadn't been for God meeting you where you were, coming in there, grabbing you on the bar stool, spinning you around and giving you a new perspective on life. If it hadn't been for the grace of God pulling you off the streets, keeping you away from the wrong crowd, holding you when you wanted to hang out with the wrong crew, keeping you from picking up the phone in the midnight hour. Come on, somebody. If it hadn't been for the grace of God, you would still be where you were doing what you were doing. But by the grace of God, you are still, you are here right now in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning. I know it ain't always been like that. I recall the time when I, I didn't get up to go to sanctuary, to go to a sanctuary on a Sunday morning. But I stayed there and I wrestled with the pillow of peace and the anointed sheets. Oh, y'all gonna act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. 
So it's the grace of God that has now transformed my mind and my heart to give me a desire to want to know more about the truth of who God is and what he's capable of doing in my own life. So one of the exhibitions of grace is the salvation of sinners, that we who are sinners can experience the forgiveness of God and have a right to everlasting life. But the other one is, if you look at the scriptural text, it talks about the literal definition, rather, it talks about the bestowal of blessings. Grace is the free and unmerited favor of God, and you can it's evidenced by the bestowal of blessings. In other words, you are exhi exhibiting, even by sitting here, the outside, the existential component of God's grace in your life. The fact that you had clothes to put on means that you are exhibiting God's grace. Some of us can testify, I can't speak for everybody, but I know my testimony is inclusive of this dynamic, that there are some places that I should not have been allowed, but it was grace that got me in. There are some jobs that I wasn't even qualified to have, but it was grace that got me the job. As a matter of fact, some of y'all can sit here and testify that if it hadn't been for God's grace, you would have never made it in college, let alone through college. Can I get somebody to testify in here? Tell somebody beside you, grace did this. Yeah, it was the undeserved because all of the mistakes that I made, the shortcomings, the shortfalls, all the wrong turns, all the wrong people, all the wrong experiences, all the things that I did that should have been, that would have been, that could have been my own demise. It was grace that arrested me and said, I've got a purpose for your life. There's something that I intend for you to do that's bigger than you can see right now. If you just turn around and pay attention, I'm trying to blow your mind. That's why the singing saints used to say, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a little wretch like me. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And so in order to understand extraordinary grace, you have to know, first of all, that it comes from an extraordinary God, but you also have to know how it is exhibited in our individual lives. Number one, through the salvation of sinners, but number two, through the bestowal of God's blessings. In this book, Paul does a masterful job at laying out. It is the most systematic book in the entire Bible. It is so systematic that you can look at every chapter and define very clearly, clearly determine what each chapter is referencing or what it is meant to address. In chapter one, it deals with the sinfulness of humanity. Jesus had to come and die for the sins to redeem the sins of all of humankind. In chapter 2, it talks about, the, it deals with the, the choices of man, the battle between flesh and the battle between spirit. It, it deals with how we wrestle with ourselves on a daily basis. In chapter 3, it deals with the rejection of Jesus Christ by the Jews, that he has come to redeem the souls of the whole world, but the Jews are rejecting him. In chapter 4, 5, and 6, it deals with sanctification, the process of how to be more like God. In chapter 7, it deals with the battles that, 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 that Paul is having with himself. He says, when I would do good, evil seems to be present on every side. Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. He, he begins to, to identify within himself the very character traits that cause him to be isolated from God instead of being close to God like he desires. And then he turns the corner in chapter 8, and he deals with the power of the new life and God's grace at work in man's life. He says there, this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. He positions it so that we understand it doesn't matter what the enemy has said. The grace of God is here to save you. It is here to give you a new life. It is salvation through Jesus Christ that causes us to be saved from our sins. But it's the power of the Holy Ghost that prevents us from keeping sinning. Are y'all with me? And so Paul breaks it down and he gives a very clear depiction and the Bible is laid out in this chapter. This book is laid out so systematic. But at the conclusion of this chapter, he turns the corner and says, I know that I've dealt with a lot of things. I've talked about the struggles between you and yourself. I've talked about the things that attack you. I've talked about uh, even, even the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. I've dealt with the Jews and the disbelievers and the doubters. I've, I've dealt with all of these concepts. He says, but this is the one thing I want to make sure I leave you with. And we know that all things 
work together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. He says, I can't leave you hanging and leave you on a low point. I've got to encourage you to know that whatever you deal with, whatever you're wrestling with, whatever is attacking you, whatever is coming against you, you have the blessed assurance of knowing that at the conclusion of it is working for your good. I don't know who that is for today, but that's good news to me. That causes me to step back, look at my problems and my trials and say at the end of the day, you can't do anything to stop what God is about to do. And it's still working for my good. At the end of the day, you can think that I'm going one way. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to look up and see that it still worked out for my good. You ever have folk to fire you from a job unjustly or undo? They gave you, uh, they gave you an unfair situation and so the door was shut. But only for you to walk out of that job and like the job that you are about to walk into much better than the... I wish I had somebody up in here. You didn't even know you were going to start a business. If they never laid you off this job, you wouldn't have started your own company. All things. All things. Somebody say all things. All things. Then he turns the corner and even concludes it even better than that. It's, it's, it's not enough that he said all things are working together for the good of them that love him and called according to his purpose. But then he had the audacity to give me this to work with. It's one of the shortest phrases, but it's probably one of the most powerful phrases in the entire scriptural text. He then turns the corner and says, if God be for you, if God be for me, then who has the audacity? Audacity to raise their head, their hand, or their voice against me. Because if God be for me, it's still going to work out for my good. Grace, if you simply define it, is favor and goodwill. The simple or short form definition is favor and good, goodwill. And so when I understand the scriptural text in verse 32, he did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for all of us, for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Somebody say all. all. Say it one more time. All. Because I need you to embrace the reality of that truth. That God has given you access to all things that are under his control. I'm going to let that sit there for a minute. Because I need you to remember what's under his control. You stressing about it. But God has already told you by, by my grace. You got access to all things. You worrying about how you're going to get this. God says, don't you understand? I've already by grace given you access to all things. So while you're over here worrying about how you're going to make it tomorrow. How you're going to pay this bill. How you're going to deal with this trial. How you're going to handle this sickness. I just told you by my grace I gave you access to all things. Here's the problem. Ephesians 2 and 8 says we are saved by grace through faith. So here's the problem. Grace is the portal, but faith becomes the activator. When we have faith, we have confidence and we believe what God has said. And if we channel that through the grace that God has already extended to us, it reaches the very heart of God and it activates the very hand of God. Okay, y'all missing it. Let me help y'all in here. The problem is not with the fact that God has given you access to all. The problem is that you don't believe it. If you would believe by faith that God has through grace given you access to all, then it causes you to speak differently. I get frustrated when I hear people say I'm broke. I don't even like to hear people say I'm sick. I need to, I need to hear people that know how to activate faith and speak in faith because grace has given them access to. Okay, let me show you what it looks like. The doctor says one thing. 
You walk out saying, oh, woe is me. I'm sick. No, you got to walk out saying, oh, thank you, doc. I'm so glad to know and to have identified where the enemy is attacking my body. But I thank God in advance that I'm already healed. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace is upon him. And by his stripes, I'm already healed. I don't like to hear people say I'm broke. I like to hear people say I'm, I'm in a season right now. But when I come out of it, I'm already already blessed. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed when I come and when I go. I'm blessed going up. I'm blessed coming down. I am wealthy in Christ Jesus. The problem is that you have to learn that the power is in your confidence. It's in your ability to believe that God can and will do everything that he said he'll do. So if God says I have access to all, that means all I got to do is start speaking in confidence. The problem is that some of you in this new year made a resolution. But I want to transform your resolution into a declaration. I don't need you to resolve. I need you to declare. Because it's already done in heavenly places. We're just waiting on the manifestation in earthly places. So I need some people to decree and declare over your own circumstance. I will have this this year. This will happen in my life. God through grace has declared I have access to all. You got to walk in and look at your kids. You will get better grades. You will turn this thing around. You will have a future. You will have a hope. You will survive. Your children's children will be blessed. The grace of God that's on me will be on your life. I need some people that ain't ashamed to lay hands on yourself. I decree in the name of Jesus that my ladder is going to be greater than my former. That I'm going to come out of this season and I'm going to look better than I came out, came into it. That this is my year. Grace gives you access to This house is mine this year. God's going to bring me out. I'm going to get that car. My healing, my joy is coming back. My peace is coming back. I'm going to be restored in everything that I do. Everything that I've been through will not hold me hostage. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus. I am the head, not the tail above and not beneath. I am the lender, not the borrower. I am more than a conqueror. I am delivered. I'm set free. I'm redeemed. I'm restored. I am. I wish I had somebody that would speak over your son. The problem is you don't believe it. I believe. You done made a believer out of me. Because if I look at the grace you've already given me, I didn't deserve anything that I got. It's because not because of any goodness of my own that I'm standing here. But the fact that I'm here tells me that God gives me access to Let me say this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You're sitting in seats. You're breathing air in this building. You're walking in this facility, in this commercial piece of property, because I had the audacity to believe the word of God. And God says that he's given me access to all. So in the face of adversity, in the face of people telling me what I couldn't do, in the face of a governmental structure that said this is commercial, you'll never be able to get this for the kingdom of God. I had the audacity to walk up on this sidewalk 
with cracked needles sitting on the inside with a busted ATM in this space. I had the audacity to lay hands on the outside of this building and decree and declare in the name of Jesus that this will be holy ground. This will be a sanctuary unto the Lord that we will conquer this piece of geography for the glory of God. I'm trying to show you this thing works. The problem is you don't believe it. The problem is not with your access. Grace gives you access, but you keep living less than your privilege because you don't believe that you have the access that you have. What are my believers in here? Whatever it is that you're looking for, whatever it is that you believe in God to do, Whatever it is you're expecting in this year, lay hands on yourself. And right now in the sanctuary, while the Holy Ghost is in this house, while the glory cloud is over this building, I dare you to start decreeing and declaring over yourself right now everything you're believing God to do. Don't wait on your neighbor. The power of life and death is in your own tongue. Open up your big mouth and speak it. Declare and decree it over your children, over your children's children, over your your business over your job I shall have it this is a test it's just a test of the emergency praise system if you believe by faith that what you just asked for through grace is already done then praise him on the level of your expectation I see you in the future you look much better than you look right now hey If you want to know who believes you, just look at me. Sit down, come on, sit down, sit down, sit down. Oh, 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 the house, the car, the healthy family, the children, the new spouse. Oh, the job, the promotion, the elevation, the increase. Oh. <laughs> sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Please sit down. If God be Come on, sit down, sit down, sit down. You're going to get that degree. Oh, don't worry about it. It's already done. Oh! Yeah, you coming out of debt. Don't worry about it. Extraordinary favor means that it ain't going to take you 30 years to pay it off. Oh. Sit down. Come on, sit down. Hey. I'm trying to move on. Come on, come on. And we know. <laughs> that all things work together for the good of them that love him called according to his purpose but here is something that I need to bring to your, your hearing and your understanding and we know that all what? 
things. All what? All things work together for the good. Here's the thing. Most of us have a preconceived notion that all things are good things. But when the Bible says, and we know that all things, it's not just talking about good things. All things are problems, setbacks, disappointments, heartbreaks, betrayals. All things is not just good things, but all things means even the bad things. So the only consolation that we have is that the hell I'm going through ain't going to last. <laughs> because it's working for my good. It's working for, you shut that door, he opened this window. You stabbed me in my back, he healed my heart in the front. It's working for my good. And so I have to caution us that when we embrace the truth of this reality, this word, this dynamic, phenomenal confirmation and consolation prize God has gifted us through this text. That if God be for us, who can be against us? All these things work together for the good of them that love him. Just because we have this, I don't want you to shout too fast. Here's the thing. There are three dimensions of this reality. First of all, Extraordinary grace translates extraordinary favor. Since grace is the unmerited favor of God. So, extraordinary grace, extraordinary favor. Favor, some, 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 specific, uh, some specific characteristics of favor. First of all, we have to acknowledge and recognize that there's the presence of favor. The reality of the presence of favor, it's not hard to embrace because uh, you know it. If you believe the word of God, God says in his truth that we have extraordinary grace or unmerited favor, that we're even saved by grace through our faith. And so because of that, I am easily enthralled and can easily embrace the truth that we have the presence of favor. And if you take it a step further, it's easy to even denote that because you have the presence of favor, you can see the proof of favor. Go home to your house and you see the proof of favor. Go get in your car, you see the proof of favor. Go check your bank account and you see the proof. Some of y'all go check your credit and you see the proof of God's favor. Come on, somebody. But there's one facet of favor that we choose to neglect. It's easy to embrace the presence. It's easy to see the proof. But we got to also take the price. Favor comes with a price. All favor comes with trouble. And favor will cause you to be in trouble with people. See, the problem with most of us is that we want the benefits of favor, but we don't want to pay the price of favor. We want God to bless us in a corner so that nobody has to see what he's doing. But God chooses to bless us openly. Most people want favor, but they don't want the criticism that comes with it. Most people want favor, but they don't want the lying and the betrayal that comes along with it. Most people want favor, but they don't want to have to handle the pressure and the responsibility that comes along with it. And you got to understand that when you have favor of God on your life, it will cause people to dislike you that don't even know you. You hate know me and you ain't even never said hello to me. You're dogging me out in corners, but you won't even say hello in public. I'm just trying to preach it like I feel it, y'all. The problem is not you. They're not upset with you. Jesus said they have not rejected you. They have rejected me. The problem is the favor that's on you. There are some people who are in trouble, but it's just not because of you. It's just because of the grace of God or the favor of God that's on you. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. 
Some people who are going to hate you just because you have a dream. Some people that are going to hate you and lie on you just because they, they don't desire to see you walk in the favor that's on you. But nah, 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 nah. <laughs> don't matter what you feel about it. Don't matter what you say about it. Don't matter how much you talk about it. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Because at the end of the day, he already gave me this divine promise. All things, the good and the bad, work together for my good. I wouldn't have worked so hard if you hadn't talked about me so bad. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have prayed so long if you hadn't betrayed me and broken my heart the way you had. I wouldn't understand what it is to embrace the word of God and speak over my own life if it hadn't been for you speaking me down. Come on here, somebody. Somebody say all things. Favor comes with a price. Nobody understands that price more than Joseph. Joseph, by far, is more, he, there's more prevalent uh, evidence of, of the price of favor in the life of Joseph than probably most of the people that are in the, in the Bible as characters. Joseph understood the price of favor from so many vantage points. The first one is that he understood the price of favor through a generational vantage point. Genesis 37 and 11, let's walk through this text for a moment. And his brothers or his brethren envied him, envied him, but his father observed the saying, envied him. Envy is a dangerous price of carrying favor. You see, jealousy says, I hate you, got it. But envy says, I'm going to make you lose it. And when you have the favor of God on your life, you can automatically assume somebody is going to envy you. The enemy has a way of invading and seeding jealousy and envy in people's hearts. And this is the sneaky thing about jealousy and envy. You don't even realize you've been arrested. You have little thoughts that end up coming into actions because you just see something and it triggers a feeling of comparison, the sin of comparison in your life. Well, you start seeing yourself in light of where somebody else is. That's one of the most dangerous setups that the enemy can do. Because the moment you start comparing, you start asking God, why don't I have what they have? They don't pray like I pray. I showed up on the second Sunday of the year. They didn't even come to church. They watch it on, on the internet. Why they blessed and I ain't blessed. And it sets you up. That's when the enemy says, now nah, I got him. Here comes jealousy and come on envy. And envy is a deadly and dangerous sin. Let me, let me show you what it looks like in real life. Yeah, jealousy says, I, I, I really, I hate, I hate you got the car. But envy says, I'm going to key the car up. Oh, you felt that one, didn't you? I wish. <laughs> see Joseph understood this from a generational perspective because Joseph's father Jacob Jacob had to fight with his brother Esau now Joseph is fighting with 10 brothers so I want you to understand that every generation because of the favor or the grace that is on you the generation that, sus that comes after you will have to fight and struggle against the whole, uh, the same rather, demonic attacks that you fought in the favor that was on you. Except that in the next generation, the enemy intensifies his efforts. And you want to know why you need to be at 5 a.m. prayer. And you want to know why you need to have a relationship with God that's so strong that you know how to cover your family. You want to know why it's important for me to teach you how to plead the blood of Jesus and make a case against the enemy over your children. You want to know and understand why it's important for you to anoint your kids while they're sleeping in their night, in their, in their night clothes. Are y'all with me? See, you got to understand that Jacob fought Esau, but now Joseph has to fight all of his brothers, which means that this is a transcendent 
pattern that's coming from one generation down to Joseph didn't have nothing to do with Jacob and Esau but yet he's still fighting against his brothers because the generational curse has been passed down to the next generation I'm trying to get you to understand that it's just the favor of God that's causing the enemy to attack you and to intensify his attacks against you Jacob's battle with his brothers started in the womb Joseph Joseph understood that he was the favorite child, but it, it, it meant nothing to him because he didn't see it the same way that his brothers did. And they were mad at him. I'll tell you why they were fighting. They were fighting because in the world perspective, there was a pecking order or there was a succession order that had to be in, in existence. In, 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 in the world vantage point, the, the firstborn son was the one to receive the inheritance. But here's the thing about God. God has a way of changing the order. He's not, he's not isolated to our world way of doing things or our world way of thinking. If you don't believe me, look at the life of David. David was the last child, the ruddy one, the one that was out in the field. But when God came looking to anoint a new king, he walked past all of the other brothers and went straight to David and said, this is the new king. That's because God had given him favor. Esther was disqualified because she was a Jew. She was an orphan. There's no reason she was supposed to be the queen. All of these other women around her who were adorned in all of their jewels and rubies and all of the, the regalia, even though she didn't have any jewelry on, the king couldn't keep Esther off his mind. When God favors you, he changes the order. And so even though it doesn't look like it makes sense and the price seems too hard for you to pay, God will flip the script and change the order and pull you to the front even when you're at the back of the line. Another portion of price of favor is they acknowledged him privately. In Genesis 37 and 19, and they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Now, mind you, they didn't call him by his name. They didn't say, behold, Joseph comes. But they said, behold, this dreamer coming. They, they called him by his destiny, not by his name. You see, understand that th this was not a public conversation. This was a private conversation. They literally were talking among themselves and saw him from afar and said, look, here comes this dreamer. A couple things that they didn't understand. Number one. The road from Shechem to Dothan was the same road that he would have had to take to go to Egypt where he would eventually become second in charge of the whole kingdom. So he was on the road to his destiny, but he just didn't know it. Some of you have been accosted and arrested by the enemy's attacks and you don't even realize you're on the way to your destiny. It doesn't matter that he's come against you. What God did is he knew that there would be need to build character and be able for you to know how to handle the favor that he was about to place on you. So he had to put you on the road that you're on and you had to deal with the attacks that you had to deal with because it's setting you up for where he's about to take you. Eventually, Joseph becomes the second in charge of the whole nation. And the very people who are trying to kill him are the ones who have to bow down and serve him. Come on here, somebody. So you got to understand what God is doing is he's strategically putting you where you need to be. You can stop asking God, why am I having to deal with this? Because you got favor. Why does this keep happening to me? Because you're on the road to your destiny. He's elevating you, but he can't elevate you until you're ready to handle it. The favor that's on your life is so incredible that people are going to depend on you from far and near. And so you got to be able to carry the weight of God's glory and that will kill you if you're not ready for it. So he has to build your prayer life. He has to get you closer and you have to know and study him more. They didn't even, they didn't call him by his name. They called him by his destiny. You see, he had a dream and he knew the start, but what he didn't understand was the process. And, and the fact that they called him by his destiny and not by his name gave me great confidence that there's a lot of people 
who, who don't, they don't like what God is doing. And so they're having private conversations. But I figured out they just can't help it. And so I'm not consumed nor worried about the private conversations. Because I figured out they're not really talking about me. What they really see is the favor that's on me. So, so even though they called him by his destiny and not his name, they, 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 the battle was not over Joseph himself. It wasn't over his title, but it was over his talent. It wasn't over his position, but it was over his power. They acknowledged him privately, but they never said it to his face. Now, you're going to have a private conversation about what God is doing in my life but you ain't going to have the audacity to say it to my face. Which means that there's a whole lot of people who are having private conversations about you. But they don't have the gall to say it to your face. It's because they recognize the favor that's on your life. Yeah, they see that you're sharp and looking good. And they're watching you out the corner of their eye. But they ain't going to never compliment you and tell you how good you look. They see the car you're driving, and they, they stop and look at it every time you drive by. But they ain't going to never compliment you on the favor that's on your life. It's a whole lot of people that look at me on Sunday, and I'm preaching until the fire comes down. But they ain't going to never say amen. I'm stirring in your Kool-Aid. I'm walking down your row. I'm all up in your business and you still ain't going to say amen. It's all good because I know you can't help yourself. You got to talk about me in the beauty shop. You got to talk about me in the barber shop. It's because of the amount of favor that I'm walking in. It ain't got nothing to do with me. It's not I, but it's just the favor of God that's working inside. Next time they look at you and they, and they don't want to say nothing to you and say, I know you can't help it and keep on moving. <laughs> Next time you hear them talking about you, don't go and tell them all. Just tell them, I know you can't help yourself. I love you. God bless you here. I'm caught up in the fog. I ain't got time to see what's happening on the ground. I ain't got time to dwell in gutter places. I ain't got time to deal with trash and mess. You're stirring mess long enough, you're going to get a little bit on you. I ain't got time. I'm caught up in the fog. Y'all know what the fog is? The favor of God. I ain't got time to deal with the stuff down here. Oh, help me, Jesus. Yeah, they talking about you. They just can't help themselves. And they have private conversations. So it means that they know what God is doing. They just got too much jealousy and envy to say anything to you about it. That's why when somebody is blessed, you need to shout with them. When somebody gets a promotion, even if it's the promotion you thought you should have, you need to celebrate them. You need to say, I'm so happy for you. God bless you. Thank God. I pray that he will keep you and cover you in the process because you don't understand the same person that is elevated today might be the one that's got to an answer to you in a few more months. Some of y'all are just around the corner from your breakthrough and you going to mess it up because of you over here being mad and envious and jealous. You got to learn how to praise God for other people. I'm glad you got the house. I thank God you got the car. I'm glad you got the increase. I'm glad God healed you because I figured out same God that did it for you. Same God. I look at your, ble your blessings. I got to say same God. You say you got what? Same God. You say he did what? Same God. You say you got promote same God. You got to understand that they tried to attack him privately. But God has a way of flipping the script and turning it around. Joseph also in verse 20, I got to rush through this. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into the pit. Cast him into the pit. And we will say some evil beast devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. See, they tried to have private conversations and, 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 and then they turned it around and decided that that wasn't enough. So we got to now try to kill him. But watch this. They weren't trying to just kill Joseph. They were trying to kill Joseph's dream. 
Some people are so disturbed and frustrated by your dream that they're not just trying to kill you. They're trying to kill your dream. But the ignorant side of that is that they assume that if they kill the dreamer, that the dream would die. But what happens is when you release the dream into the atmosphere, somebody's going to catch it. And even if you're not the one to carry it to full fruition, the dream will live even when the dreamer is gone. Y'all don't believe me? Every year about this time, we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The dreamer was killed, but the dream still lives. It was too late. Tell the devil, it's too late. I done already started decreeing and declaring what a God is about to do in my life. It's too late. You should have got you should have got Joseph before he released that dream. But the fact that he released the dream meant that it was too late for the enemy to take it down. So that's why you can't be you got to have enough faith and confidence to start speaking those things that are not as though they are. You got to start telling people this is what God is going to do for me. This is where I'm about to go. This is the season that I'm in. See, you don't believe it. That's why you won't speak it. You're trying to be too cautious. I don't want to put it out there because I don't want, I don't want people to think that, that, you know, if it don't work out, that's the problem right there. You just canceled your own faith. Let me tell you the other lie that the enemy tells you, I don't want to put it out there because if you put it out there, then, then somebody else is going to try to do it. Let me, let me help you understand what God anointed you to do. Can't nobody else do it. They can imitate it, but it can never be duplicated. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Holler if you hear me. What God has for you, it's for you. They can, let me tell you, let me tell you about me. Somebody had the audacity to ask me one day, if, if was I threatened that they were going to plant a church next to mine? I said, baby, I'll give you a tent in the parking lot and you can do what you feel because what God has for me is for me. And whatever God has assigned me to do, he has anointed me to be able to do it. It'll kill you. I tell people all the time, if I wanted to kill my enemies, I'd give them my job. Because what's, what is for you is only But you cancel your faith and you do not allow yourself to speak it because you're afraid. Fear and faith can't occupy the same space at the same time. One of them is going to have to leave. So you have to decide which one is going to stay and which one has to go. Well, let me just tell you about me. This year, fear got to go. You can't live in my house. I don't want you in my mind. I don't need you at my church. I don't need you in my study. I don't need you in my private time. I don't want you riding in my car. Fear and faith can't hang out with each other. I need faith because faith gets me to grace. Grace moves me towards God and God will give me access to all. Are y'all with me? Tell fear you got to go. I ain't scared no more. I'm stepping out on faith. I'm about to do some things that's going to blow your mind. I'm about, to, I'm about to launch out on nothing, but nothing is going to land on faith, and faith is going to lift me to where I'm supposed to be. This is my year. They attacked him, and they tried to kill the dream and the dreamer, but then they, they decided that wasn't enough, so they attacked him publicly. Verse 23, and it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brethren that they stripped the very external sign of the favor that was on his life. They snatched the coat of colors off of his back. They were trying to openly and publicly make people know that I'm taking the favor off of you. How foolish of them. Because you can't take off of me what comes from in me. The same God that gave me that coat can give me another coat. The same God that blessed me with that job can give me another job. Here's what I want to, I want to put this in your spirit. Favor floats. If, if you've ever seen a barber... If you ever, I don't know if y'all country enough to have gone fishing. We went fishing. We didn't have fancy rods and reels. We had cane poles. Tie a string around the cane. Look at that. What's a cane pole? <laughs> so citified. Help them, Lord Jesus. But my granddaddy would put a barber on the end of it, and we'd throw it out there. And when that barber would sink, you would know you had something. And so every time you push the barber down, it pops back up. Okay, I got something for y'all, because that, that may be too heavy for you. I don't know what a, a barber, a barber, a barber, 
What, what is a barber? Y'all probably had something like this up here. You remember them rubber duckies? See, that's a shame. You ever get in the bathtub as a kid and you try to push that duck under the water, what does it do? Pop back up. I don't care how hard you push it down, how long you hold it down, if you let it go, it's going to automatically pop back to the top. That's what your favor is like. I don't care how hard the enemy tries to push you down, what he strips off of you, how many coats of colors he takes for you, how long he tries to keep you down, he's got to take his hands off of you because if you decree and declare in the name of Jesus that he must loose you, he's got to be obedient to the power of Jesus' name. Loose my house, pop back up. Loose my children, pop back up. Loose my finances, pop back up. Loose my family, pop back up. Loose my joy, Pop back up. Somebody shall favor floats. Ain't nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so finally, thank you, Jesus. They came to the conclusion, we got to throw him in the pit. This is it. It's the last straw. <laughs> and they were about to kill him. And the enemy's plot and plan was to destroy him so they were going to throw him in a pit but I need you to pay attention to certain verbiage in verse 24 it says and they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty watch this and there was no water in it see the pit that they threw him in most of us have this mindset that it's something that they physically dug up and created a hole in the ground, a deep hole, and they threw him in the hole. But the pit, the only reason that the scripture says, and there was no water in it, is because the pit was not a man-made, a physical pit that they had created. But it was a well that they had stumbled upon. So it wasn't a pit after all. It was actually an abandoned well. If you look at the woman at the well of Samaria... And they've done archaeological studies that the well that they, they say that she and Jesus talked beside was 75 feet deep. This territory where they were in Shechem was only 12 miles from Samaria. And this whole region was known for having wells throughout the territory. And so this region was known for their wells and the average size or depth of every well was 45 to 65 feet deep. And the Bible says that the brothers, they didn't lower him into the well. They didn't ease him down in the well. But the Bible says they cast him into the well, which means that they threw him into the well. What person do you know that can fall 45 to 65 feet down and survive? The only reason he would have been able to survive is that he had extraordinary grace on his life. Some stuff that would have killed somebody else didn't even scratch the surface with you because of the extraordinary favor. Some people would have been crazy by now if they had gone through some of the stuff you've been through. But because of the extraordinary favor that he had on your life, it didn't take you out. See, everything you go through might have been that he sustained some injuries. But even if he sustained injuries, it didn't make the story. Because God declares that everything that you go through ain't newsworthy. Some things that you go through, he won't even let your enemies know you're going through it. Some things that you endure, he doesn't even think is worthy to be spoken again. Some things ain't even worth repeating. I ain't got to call a prayer meeting because you done lied on me. I ain't got to call a prayer meeting because you done rolled your eyes at me. Some things ain't even worth bothering God about. You don't have to tell everybody that somebody betrayed you. They'll know it because sooner or later, the same person that betrayed you is going to show themselves to that person and they're going to figure that thing out. Come on here, somebody. I want you to pay attention. They began to throw him, cast him into the pit. And they had made up their mind before they tossed him down that they were going to kill him. But two things happened. First of all, Reuben happened. 
in Genesis 37, 20 and 22, Reuben began to plead with his brothers. He says, listen, let's not kill him. Let's not lay a hand on him. Reuben stepped in and said, that's, that's our brother. I don't want y'all to kill him. That, I mean, after all, Reuben was, he was trying to figure out a way to, to help with compassion and get him back to their father. So Reuben intervened. And then the other person that stepped in and said something was his other brother, Judah. Judah stepped up to the plate and said, listen, at the end of the day, that's our brother. He is a flesh of our flesh. Let's not lay a hand on him and let's not kill him. Yeah, we put him down in the pit, but let's not even leave him down there in the pit because he's going to die. Let's get him out of the pit. So Reuben had compassion on him and tried to talk the brothers out of killing him before they threw him in the pit. But Judah came along and said, listen, let's take him out of the pit. I mean, at the end of the day, that's our brother. Let's just go ahead and sell him into slavery. And for 30, for 20 pieces of silver, which equals about $30 in our money in that day, they sold him to the, to the merchant men that were passing by. But they pulled him out of the pit. And so I began to do my own study, thank you, Holy Ghost, and figure out the literal translation of the names of his brothers who intervened on his behalf. The enemy had made a decision that he was going to kill Joseph and he was going to use his own brothers to do it. Sometimes the people that hurt you the worst are the people that you think are closest to you. Never in a million years would Joseph have imagined that his own brothers would treat him like this. He didn't ask for the favor. God gave it to him. He didn't do anything to offend them. He just told them what God showed him. But here it is that they made a decision to kill him. But Reuben and Judah stepped in. Reuben, if you look at the literal translation of the name Reuben, it means compassion and understanding. God will always send somebody while you're in your pit to offer you Reuben or compassion and understanding. So it was the compassion and and understanding of Reuben that caused the brothers to stay their hand. He said, listen, at the end of the day, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him into the pit. So compassion and understanding saved his life. But then here comes Judah. And Judah, if you look at the literal translation of Judah, it means praise. So Reuben kept him from dying before he went in the pit. But praise came along and pulled him out of the pit. I just want to encourage somebody in here today and remind you that Reuben will get you and keep you from being killed before you go in the pit. But if you want to come out of your pit situation, you got to learn how to call your big brother Reuben to the rescue. Well, what do you mean call Reuben to the rescue? Well, I'm so glad you asked. If you want to know how to break the enemy's hold on your life. If you've been in a pitiful situation way too long. The Bible gives us evidence right here that Reuben will keep you before you fall in the pit. But Judah is going to get you out of your pitiful situations. I see some of y'all are having a hard time grabbing hold. Reuben wouldn't let him kill him. But Judah made him pull him out. Mercy wouldn't let him kill him. But praise got him out. Is there anybody here that wants to come out today? I want to give you the keys to the, the remedy to get out of your pitiful situation. You got to learn how to embrace the grace that's on your life. If God before me who can be against me what do you say to these things and we 
know that all things work together for the good of them that love him and called according to his purpose. Well, how can I shout when I'm at the bottom, Pastor? How can I praise when all hell is breaking loose? How can I give him glory when I'm in the middle of a pitiful situation? I'm so glad you asked. All you got to do is remember that God gave you access to all, all of the joy. It's already yours. All of the restoration, it's already done. All of the peace, it's already yours. All the deliverance, it's already yours. What God is waiting on is for you to send up enough Judah for him to reach down pull you out, restore you, deliver you, send up Judah, somebody praise, pull me out God, I'm ready, pull me out God, next level, pull me out God, I see increase, pull me out God, I ain't worried about them, I'll shout by myself, I'll praise by myself, been down here too long, ready pull me up God here I am pull me up God increase and anointing somebody praise somebody praise somebody praise praise him fall praise him fall hey Judah, Judah in the house, Judah in the house, praise in the building, praise in the building. When you're driving home, just start praising. When you walk in your job, just start praising. When you go in the break room, just start praising. When you go back to the bank, just start praising. When you check the mail, just start praising. Don't wait till you see it. He's pulling you out. He's lifting you up. Somebody praise. Somebody bless him. Somebody give him glory. Somebody lift him. Pray. 